Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Glad you're here. Uh, before we get going, I want to just direct your attention to something in the bulletin. We've got a um, special time coming up in the life of our church. It's our 60th anniversary as a church. And so we've got a couple special dates in there I want you to make sure you know about. We're going to be up at our North Campus on September 10th. This is a church-wide event. I want everybody to come up. There'll be food. We're going to hang out. We're going to have a lot of good time. We're going to have an outdoor worship service. A lot of good things. Please come be a part of that. Uh, more details will come, but that's September 10th. Save that date if you would. And then on October 1st, we'll have a Sunday of celebration where we'll be celebrating our 60th in services. And then we'll be back that evening for a special banquet, a churchwide banquet to come and to celebrate. There'll be some special videos shared, uh, some other uh, things as well coming. So make sure you know about that uh, and to be a part. Uh, and let's celebrate what God's done in the past and what he's going to do into the future. All right, now listen, um, today I'm going to ask you to uh, give me your attention um, because what we find in today's uh, message in, in the scriptures are uh, some truths I think will be very helpful to all of us. If you remember last week, we, we've been going through Psalm 119 and we found that the psalmist has been walking in obedience to the Lord, walking in faithfulness, but it was a very difficult time as he was doing it. He had uh, those who were against him, his enemies, who were not happy uh, that he was walking in the truths of God's word, and they were doing everything they could to make his life hard. They lied against him, they ostracized him, they um, set traps for him. They were making it very difficult. Last week we saw that it kind of came to a culmination for the psalmist. He was a little frustrated. It's hard to continue to walk in faithfulness when you see all those around you not walking in faithfulness, and it seems like you're having a hard time and they're doing just fine. That can be hard. And so last week we saw that the psalmist was very uh, truthful and honest with how he felt to the point of, really, he came, if you remember last week, to the point of giving God instructions of what God needed to do. We're tempted to do that as well in our lives sometimes, I think. And he instructed God, hey, God, it's time for you to judge my enemies. And we see that he kind of comes to his senses at the end of that. He really kind of shared some things that really we find in the last of the text last week that he kind of came back to himself. And we talked about how sometimes we may say something in the moment and then kind of regret that we said it. Has anybody ever been there, right? It's kind of where the psalmist was, okay? And so now we find he turns the corner and today what he's going to do is he's going to do something opposite of that. He's going to, uh, he's going to really declare to us the goodness of God. He's going to come back to his senses and say, you know what, as, as I really think about my life, God is a really good God. And as we see these facets of God's goodness in our life, even when life's hard, we're going to see two responses from the psalmist that I think are good responses to come from our lives as well. And so today we're really going to talk about that life is hard, but God is good. And that's very important for us to remember because life is hard, is it not? But right along with that truth is, God is good. He's good in the middle of all of it. And so we're going to see that in, in the scripture today. Now, if we're going to talk about the goodness of God, we really need to understand what that means. We need to have uh, some standard to reference if we're going to call God good. You know, if, if I say that I have a good dog, what am I saying? I'm saying that he comes when I call him means he's a housebroken, means he's not going to bite people. That's what that means. Now, if I say you're a good person, I'm not saying that you're going to come when I call and you're not going to bite people and you're housebroken. That, that's not the same standard, right? The same standard of calling my dog good is not the same standard I would use to call you good, or at least I hope not, right? But when we think about God and we think about his goodness, what is the standard that you use for God? What's the standard that you use for God's goodness when you think about that? Well, God is the standard for what is good. We know that from his word because God declares, you shall be holy as I am holy. The standard of righteousness is God's own character. Now, who in the room is good compared to that? None of us. None of us are good compared to God's goodness but you see, we know that because we're born, Scripture says, in this world 
with a problem, with a sin nature. We are not born naturally good, no matter how often the world wants to think that. We're born with a problem. But God, in his goodness, made a way for that greatest problem that we have, that sin, to be removed and taken away. So we too can walk in the goodness of God through Christ. Amen? So that's the standard of good we're talking about. God is that standard of goodness. And what we need to do is to trust God and his goodness. And we need to trust that God is good even when life is not. Some of you recently have had to claim that truth. I've had to claim that truth at times in my life. And I'm sure everyone in the room at some point is going to have to claim that truth. That yes, life is hard, but God is good. So today I want us to see four facets of God's goodness, I think, that the psalmist tells us about. And we need to appreciate them. You know, sometimes we take the goodness of others for granted, right? Uh, kids do that with their parents quite often, right? They take for granted the goodness of their parents, right? They just expect or they just, you know, your parents are so good to your kids, but you just feel like they just take it all for granted. Can I get an amen in here on that? Yeah, it happens. But guess what? We as adults can do the same thing. And we can presume upon God and we can accept all of his goodness in our life and all the many facets that it comes to us. We can accept all the goodness of God, but we take it for granted if we're not careful. Today's a reminder to us of how to walk and to really appreciate the goodness of God. And so I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you need another round of coffee. I don't need if you, I know if you need another Diet Mountain Dew, whatever you need. But I'm asking you to give me your attention and to think on the goodness of God in your life. God's Word says this in Psalm 119, starting at verse 129. <clears throat> your testimonies are wonderful, Therefore, my soul keeps them. The enfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise. Let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. So first, let's look at the first point and let's consider today God's goodness on display. It's here for us to see in the text. In verse 129, let's start there. In God's goodness, he, he does this for us. He inspires through his word. He gives inspiration to our lives through the truth of his word. Verse 129, your testimonies, your word, it says, are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. Now, to really understand what's being said here, the word wonderful is used in the ESV, which is a good word, but to understand fully what this is saying about the truth of God's word is that God's word is wonderful, but think supernatural. Think magnificent. Think powerful. Think miraculous. This is what God's word is to us. God's word inspires us. God inspires us through his word, and he does it in all of the Old Testament, and he does it as we look into the New Testament, as we can read God's word and to see how mightily God moves in ways that only God can do. He moves in the Old Testament, and he does wonders and works and miracles, as well as in the New Testament as well. But we see the works in the Old Testament, we turn to the New Testament, and then we find the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how inspiring is it to know that the truth of the gospel is when we turn from our sin and we turn to our Savior, our whole destiny changes for all of eternity. Can you think about that? What more can inspire you than that? That we, those who are born in sin, can turn from sin and turn to Christ and in that moment receive a new life. 
that we're made a new creation and that we have eternity to look forward to. That is inspirational and it comes from the truth of the very word of God. That all happens, why? Because of God's goodness to us. We didn't deserve to even receive this word, but God in his goodness superintended through the power of the Holy Spirit, every word that we have here, and in it is the inspirational good news of the gospel for our lives. God in his goodness inspires us through his word. It's so amazing, it's so inspirational. But what happens is we live in a world that is so overstimulated with every other thing that's in the world. We're so distracted, we can even forget that. We find inspiration if our ball team wins, right? You feel an exhilaration because we won a game we wanted to win. I get it, I do that too, especially if IU football wins, I'm gonna feel exhilarated to win one game. We, these are, we, we, what I'm saying is we get inspired by things that don't even matter. But then we hear things that absolutely matter where all of eternity hangs in the balance and we can hear that God in his goodness inspires us through his word and we go, eh, okay, that's nice. No, this is the goodness of God being displayed to us even though we don't deserve it. And he's not even done. That's just the first of, of three more points to come. God inspires us through his word. And second, God illuminates through his wisdom. He gives us understanding. Look what it says in verse 130. The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Well, let's just stop there for a second. God is so good to us that he can take his profound wisdom and make it accessible, it says, to the simple. I like that because that's me. I'm simple. What about you? Now, some of you were in advanced classes in school, okay? I wasn't in your classes, all right? I was in the simple classes. But it doesn't matter because God is so good to us that he comes to us, he gives us light. He gives us understanding. He illuminates our minds in a way that only God can, even to the simple. Look what it says. The unfolding of your words gives light. There, there's a sense and an understanding here of an unfolding. It's, it's this idea of a tent uh, in this time. The tents were made out of animal skins oftentimes. And when the tent was folded closed by the door, there was no light to get in. It was dark. It was pitch dark. But by the unfolding of the door of the tent, the light could come in. And we've got to understand that as we spend time in the Word of God, if we will read the Word of God, God will unfold to us the truth of God's Word. He'll bring illumination into our minds, even though we're simple. And that is a goodness of God. For Him to come to operate that way in our lives in verse 135, it, it says, it's a reference to this idea of illumination. Let's see what it says in 135. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. Most likely the trouble of the psalmist had made him feel as if God was not near at all. That God was far off. But he comes here and he says, make your face shine upon your servant. Teach me your statutes. His desire was to know God in his word. And God in his grace and mercy does make his face to shine upon us when we turn from ourselves and we turn to him. And God comes near. And he unfolds to us the very truth of his word. He illuminates through his wisdom. And that is a goodness of God. But that's going to require a few things from us. It's going to require humility and honesty on our part that we need his wisdom more than we need ours. It will require us to desire, to, to, it will require us to die to ourselves and surrender to him and to say, God, I, I don't need my wisdom, I need your wisdom. And if we can get there and if we'll come and spend time in the word of God, he will show us what we need to know. He will teach us, he will instruct us in his truth. 
God is good because he inspires us through his word. He illuminates us with his truth. And third, he does something else. He inclines his heart to us. Now, this is a big one. He inclines his heart to us. Verse 132, look what it says. Turn to me, the psalmist says, and be merciful or be gracious to me. Listen, listen, everybody listen. As is your way. Did you hear that? As is your way with those who love your name. This is telling us something very important about God. This is God's way. This is how God operates. For those who love his name, his response is grace and mercy. Spurgeon put it this way, if God looks and sees us panting for him, he will not fail to be merciful to us. If you get to the point in your life where you turn from your sin and yourself and you turn to Jesus, the response you'll get from him is grace and mercy. That is a goodness of God. Because guess what? We don't deserve God's grace and mercy. But his response is, his standard operating procedures, some of you may be familiar with that, right, at work. We have standard operating procedures. This is God's standard operating procedure. It's right here in the verse. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. This is how he operates. This is him and his goodness. You see, without God's grace and mercy... We're doomed. <laughs> you know that, right? Right? Without God's grace and mercy in your life, applied to your life, we're, we're all doomed. We have no hope. Why? Because of what I've referenced already, because of our sin that we're born into. Without God's grace and mercy, we have no hope. We're separated from a perfect and holy God. We, we, are, we, are, not in good, we, we are not in good standing. We're dead in our sins. But because he is good and gracious to us, he gives to those who love him what they do not deserve. He gives us grace. And he also does not give to us what we do deserve, which is his mercy. Aren't you thankful? Listen, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Listen to what God's word says of how God operates with those who, who love him. But God being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with him in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, seated with us, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. This is God's standard operating procedure for those who love him. Who those, those who desire him. He gives us grace and mercy. And all God's people said, what's the next point? <laughs> Do you ever presume upon the grace and mercy of God? Do I? You see, God in his goodness operates this way. He chooses to operate exactly this way. He inspires us through his word. He illuminates us by giving us his wisdom. He inclines his heart to us by giving us grace and mercy. And one last way that we see his goodness in the text, in verse 133, and we see it in 134, he insulates us in his power. He insulates us in his power. I want to talk about that. Look what it says. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression, that's his enemies, that I may keep your precepts. I believe we find the reality of God providing safety and security in these verses. He steadies our steps according to his promise we have a firm foundation in which we can plant our lives upon, which is built on the promises of God. We can 
live in such a way where sin doesn't have to take dominion over us because of his protection, his safety, his power applied to our lives. Verse 134, we see that there's allusions to his protections from enemies as well. But the ability to live that way was was going to require God to insulate him from the difficulties in his life. Now, I don't mean insulation as in insulating something away from everything. What I'm talking about is insulation is helpful in this life because insulation brings safety and security and usefulness. Think about it. Electric wires are insulated. It makes them safe and secure. It makes them useful. If you just put a bunch of electrical wires together with no insulation on them, what's going to happen? Something bad. And I'm not an electrician. Believe me. But I know that. The insulation on the wires makes them useful, makes them secure, makes them safe. Your hand is safe and secure and useful if you put an oven mitt on it before you get the pie out of the oven, right? It insulates your hand. It keeps your hand safe and protected. And it makes it useful to be able to get the pie out. Do not get the pie out without the oven mitt on. You need the insulation to be safe and protected and useful in the moment. You are safe, secure, and useful, protected when you go out into 12 inches of snow and you put that winter parka on, you pull it up around your face and you got all the fur right there, right? Your your little eyeballs are sticking out. You are safe and secure and protected. You are useful to be able to remove the snow in the moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you go out there in just a t-shirt, you're not going to be useful for very long because you have no insulation. And I believe the psalmist is saying, God, I need you to insulate me now, not to keep me away from everything in the world, but dear God, insulate me in the middle of the world so I can be safe and protected and useful for your glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you see, that happens in our life because of the goodness of God. You see, when you know God personally through his son, Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us time and time again that you are in Christ. Think of it as you are insulated in Christ. Your life has changed. You now are safe and secure and protected and useful because God has insulated you into himself. Hmm. The Bible is replete with this. I'm going to give you a few of them because as I do, you're going to be reminded of how good your God is as you consider your life in Christ. You see, in Christ Jesus, you were given grace before the world was created. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He gave us grace in Christ Jesus before the ages began. In Christ Jesus. Jesus, you were chosen by God before creation. Ephesians 1, 4, listen to what it says. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In Christ Jesus, you are loved by God with an inseparable love. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that is good. Yes, ma'am, that is shouting ground right there. In Christ Jesus, you were redeemed and forgiven for all of your sins. Ephesians chapter 1, 7. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ Jesus, you are justified before God and the righteousness of God in Christ is imputed to you. It's given to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Do you hear the goodness of God in these verses? In Christ Jesus, you have become a new creation and a son of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Listen, if anyone is what? In Christ, he is a new creation. Old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God insulates us through the power of the gospel to make us safe and secure and protected and useful to live for his glory. And all of that happens because of the goodness of our God. 
If you're a Christian and you're in here today and you don't leave encouraged, there is something wrong. Because that is how good God is to us. And we deserve none of it. But he chooses to operate this way with us. Now you consider that, and you consider where the psalmist was last week. He's come a far away in a short time. He went from wanting to God's judgment to fall on his enemies, and he was kind of upset and bitter and trying to direct God to now. He's come to his senses, and now he is declaring very clearly God's greatness to those who God's greatness and goodness to those who needed to hear it. So let's see two things very quickly, two responses that we should have to God's goodness in our life. Let's get to the first one quickly. It's in verse 131. We find it. Let's read it. The psalmist now says, I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. So the first response to God's goodness should be to desire God's truth insatiably. Meaning, to desire God's truth in an ongoing way basis, to desire in such a way that it is a, a, it is a strong passion in your life. You're panting after God's truth. Danny Aiken said it this way in his commentary, the psalmist appetite for Holy Scripture cannot be satisfied. I'm, I'm on a health journey right now, okay? So that means I'm on a diet, okay? And so I can, I can relate to this because I have an insatiable appetite for just about any kind of food. If I let myself, I mean, you put me, well, never mind. Let's just not get into that. You get the point. You get that strong urge. Does anyone here had that? Where you, you have an insatiable need for something. You just can't get enough of it, right? Now that plays out in all kinds of bad ways when we're talking about food and drink and stuff like that. But we're talking about our lives. The psalmist says, God, I cannot get enough of your word. And that's one response to the goodness of God. And if you will think more about the goodness of God instead of the hardships of your life, you will find you will desire his word even more. And you'll understand that when life is hard, that's the time when you lean in and you remember how good God is to you. Do you know that even this morning when you opened your eyes, you just experienced the goodness of God? Do you know that when you went... You experience the goodness of God. He gives us the very breath that we breathe. And you look at your life and all around of all the good that you experience in your life, you have all of that good that came to you. It only came to you because of why? The goodness of God. We've got to remember that. And let that goodness breed a strong desire in us to crave more of the word of God. To pant like, like a deer is panting for water when they are just so thirsty. Now we lose the sense of how important this is because we live in a day and time where, where it's not hard for us to get food and water, right? I mean, you go home, even for those that don't have a lot of money, most people, you know, if you, you got a house, you know, you can go to the fridge and find something to eat. You can turn the tap water on, you can drink tap water. And for some of you, you can drink tap water. I'm just letting you know. But if you want, you can get the fancy stuff, you know, and the sparkling water. You can, we can get the, you know, whatever kind of waters. They're everywhere, right? So we lose a little bit what it means to pant with thirst. I mean, I go outside and cut the grass for 30 minutes. I'm come stumble into the garage. I'm like, oh, my gosh, wait the water. Right, I get the water. Oh, I thought I was going to thirst to death. Really, Alan? Not really. There are people who don't have food. There are people that don't have drink. They know the craving and the longing for it. That's what we're talking about and how we should look at God's word and see. It's not a rule book. It's a guidebook. It's God's word to us and we should desire it and long for the truth found in it. That's what the psalmist is saying. There's more I could say there, but I'm gonna move on. Second response from our lives when considering God's goodness for us is to have a concern in our hearts for the spiritual condition of the lost, those who walk in disobedience. Now listen to what he said. This is such a change from last week. 
Last week, remember, he instructed God, hey, God, it's time for you to do some judging on my enemies. Bring it down. Bring, it on, bring the fire down, God. Go ahead and judge them. It's what I think you need to do. And then we saw last week, he kind of came back to his senses. And this week, look at the change. Look at what's going on in his heart now. As he reflects on the goodness of God, look what he says. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. It just simply means as, as he has taken time to think about the goodness of God, his heart is soft and he is tore up over the lost condition of those who were his enemies, those who were walking in disobedience. He knew they were in trouble spiritually and it moved him to tears. Now, look what it says. We're not even just talking about, you know, somebody working a teardrop up in the corner of your eye and it kind of falls. Okay, that's a tear. Look what it says. My eyes shed streams of tears. I was thinking about that. When was the last time that I shed streams of tears for the lost? Yes, I'm concerned that people don't know Christ. I'm concerned that people walk in disobedience. And I, I'm concerned, you know, but really, is it, what, what is going on in my heart? I'm a pastor, right? Should I not have my eyes wet with streams of tears for the spiritual condition of those that desperately need to hear the truth of the gospel? Is that not only a natural response, I've received the goodness of God in my life. I mean, I've been forgiven of sin. I've, I have a future and I hope all those things I've talked about. But should I just consume all the goodness of God in my life and have no concern for those who don't know him? I think a right response would be broken in my heart. That God's goodness is so good that others don't receive it. They don't know it. And it should move me to have a concern for them. But oftentimes what churches do, what pastors do, what Christians do, is that we shake a fist at the world because the world is, is so sinful. It's not the way it should be. And so oftentimes what we do is we build churches and we come inside churches and we shut the doors and we have holy huddles and we're just so good, thankful for the goodness of God applied to our life. But what we need to do is experience the goodness of God and let it be a motivator to us to not just sit in this place, but to go outside these walls and to say, God, wherever I go, help me to have a grave concern and a heart and a love for those that don't know you, those in my family, those I work with, those in my neighborhood. And let's not make excuses to why it's just not, there's not time or it's not the right time or whatever it may be. Just ask God to help you respond to his goodness by having a strong desire to know his word and have another strong desire in your heart to care for those that don't know him so they too can experience the goodness of God. May God help us do this and live this way.